Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have a wonderful presentation. Um, that we have ready for you. This is Digital Jobs and Safe Work Environments, Technology's Role During COVID-19 and Beyond. I want to start by uh, just introducing myself. My name is Piper Cleveland. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager at Mintech. Um, and I will be observing everything on the back end today. So if you have any questions at all during the presentation, feel free to uh, write them in the questions window and I can see to them for you during the presentation. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things off to Steve Riedel. Steve is the Regional Trade Manager for the Western Europe and Environmental and Energy Industries at the Minnesota Trade Office. And he will be leading this presentation today. All right, take it away, Steve. Thank you, Piper. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have a what I think is a, is a great topic, one that responds directly to events going on right now. Um, before we get into our topic, I want to say thank you to the Minnesota Technology Association and, and especially to Piper Cleveland for being such a great partner and allowing us to be part of the new community of Minnesota Technology Association. We want to congratulate Mintech for the transition that they just made. I mean, it's always a major initiative to rebrand yourself, come up with a new logo. Uh, you know, everything you do has a slightly different look to it. Uh, and from what I've seen so far, and I and I and I think that my fellow panelists, as well as folks at that uh, who are members of your organization, I think you'll agree that the transition is off to a good start. So I wish you all the best with the rebranding and relaunch of the Minnesota Technology Association, well done. So context, uh, when we conceived of this event, right around the time of this year's IoT Fuse, um, I had gotten a phone call from one of our panelists today, uh, Kim Pearson, who said, you know, companies that are uh, can can work remotely are doing better right now. And, and that was a, a light bulb that went off fairly easily for me. And, so we we were thinking about this uh, fairly early um, in the time of the um, of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown and restrictions and and uh, workplace adjustments and so forth. But little did we know that another uh, crisis would uh, you know all but overtake the first one. We're dealing with twin crises right now. So there's lots of businesses that are adjusting. Just when all these businesses were preparing to start to open, at least the ones that had. Uh, had some restrictions, uh, especially restaurants and other types of businesses. A second crisis happened and they ended up delaying their opening. But now things are so fluid. Uh, Mall of America just reopened yesterday, not, you know, not in major numbers, but so there's all kinds of transitions and everyone is asking, how do we adjust? So part of what we want to talk about today um, is this adjustment. Uh, so we're really grateful that we've got maybe about 38 folks joined today. I also want to acknowledge um, the executive director of the Minnesota Trade Office, Gabrielle Gerbeau. She uh, is planning to join today. I really regret we don't have a chance to introduce you to Gabrielle in person and give her a chance to say a few words. So Gabrielle, thank you for joining. But to all of you who haven't met Gabrielle, uh, we know we really miss the fact that we can't do these events in person. So please join us at a trade office event in the future so you can also meet Gabrielle. So the adjustment, how do we adjust and how can technology play a role? I mean, I can't think of a better partner to be, uh, to be sharing this event opportunity with than, than the Minnesota Technology Association because uh, there's gonna be people on this call who uh, who already understand this, for whom it's already intuitive. There's other groups where they don't yet know what the letters IOT even mean. And for those folks, if you are on this call today and you're saying, what does IOT stand for? Don't worry, we are gonna cover that. Um, but for those of you who do, um, we're grateful because you are an asset to this state. You have a role to play in this and that's part of our message today. So let's get into the topic. I have a handful of slides to further set the stage before we hand off the presentation to one of our expert panelists today. Uh, so uh, my first slide, what's the Minnesota Trade Office? We're the state's export promotion agency. So if you sell your goods or services overseas, we are, we are our office exists to help you. What's, what's good for exporting is also good for our economy. That's why we exist. My title is regional trade manager. So I have a territory. I cover um, the European Union, plus a couple of other countries. And I have colleagues who cover the rest of the world. So I have colleagues who cover Canada and Mexico, uh, Africa and the Middle East, uh, Latin America, 
China, et cetera. So you name the country and someone in our office has responsibility for, for it, we'd be, we'd be happy to talk to you about your own um, efforts to grow your business internationally. Some of us also have industry responsibilities. Mine happen to be environmental and energy industries. Those two sectors happen to be touched by in internet of things a lot. Those industries have become very smart in recent years. So that's part of the reason I'm interested in this topic today. The other thing we're known for is governor led trade missions. I've been with the trade office 18 years. I've been on trade missions quite a few with governor Pawlenty uh, and a few with governor Dayton. Uh, we haven't had one with governor Waltz yet. This is not a good year for trade missions. We hope the day comes when we do go on one, but when the time comes, we hope you'll join us on one of those. So why would the trade office, why would an export promotion agency even look at a topic like this? Why are we involved? Well, the challenges that we have here, how can we, how can we stay at work? How can we keep our workplaces safe? And by the way, that's part of what we're talking about today. It isn't just about remote work, it's also about safe work. And uh, so Kim is mostly about the remote side of things and Bob is gonna tell you a little bit about safe workplaces. That's a separate topic that's closely related and te technology absolutely plays a role. These challenges are also opportunities. On the supply side of this question, how do we make it happen with technology? Well, a lot of that technology and a lot of the services and expertise, they exist right here in Minnesota. So we wanna, we wanna uh, pivot and also say, hey, there's an opportunity here. There's a, there's a chance to promote Minnesota and its businesses internationally. And, that, and that's, that's my biggest interest in this. So we're talking about in-person versus digital jobs. And it's the difference, between, and, and by the way, the language, the very vocabulary we use for this topic, it's, it's been in transition lately. And I'm, I'm noticing terms that I hadn't seen before, like blended work. So this is sometimes talk, referred to as remote or blended work. Any organization that's able to transition its mission or production to remote work is more resilient. They and their workers enjoy a number of benefits. First of all, work's not interrupted. Those of us who can work from home, our work is not interrupted. We can keep doing it. Workers are safe. A worker that is able to work remotely isn't, isn't exposed to others who might have the virus, obviously. And our state likes uh, any trend where we can manage the number of unemployment applications. Um, my colleagues who work in unemployment insurance are by far the busiest folks at the Department of Employment and Economic Development right now. They're working extra long hours, and I'm pleased to say our state's doing better than other states, but it's still a massive disruption, and it's really costly. And anybody who doesn't have to apply for an unemployment insurance benefit um, is, is good for our economy. So if remote work uh, lends itself to that, that's good for all of us. Uh, this is a story, this is just a snapshot from The Economist magazine, uh, they, which, is a, which I find to be very good at trend spotting way back in April. And when I say way back, it's because we can't believe how time is moving right now. They declared the death of the office, um, that, that, people, that maybe people won't be going back and we're already seeing that. So this incredible change underway already. And the question is how far will it go? Well, we're already starting to see companies um, especially the social media companies saying, you know what, um, we're going to stay with this the, with this model. Folks who are working at home, they're performing well, and we're going to stick with this model. So all of this is going to lead to transitions in leasing of office space and how you consider the, the, those overheads uh, and what kind of setups you actually have. So so the trend is underway. It's pretty clear. And what's it going to look like a year from now? We don't know, but we. But I'm I'm convinced that um, that a lot of these the changes we're seeing right now are going to stay here. What's the role for IoT? It's about more than just working from home and answering your email. It's about what can be monitored. That's really part of it. What remote capable jobs are virus resilient jobs? The jobs that uh, allow people to stay safe. They're layoff resistant. People avoid exposure. Um, and Minnesota has got the technology and the expertise. I bolded that because I want to again emphasize that we can we can market our expertise and our technology to an international audience. What jobs are we talking about? It's basically across the board. It's not just tech jobs. Any job that where IoT can play a role is, is basically in play here. Here's a new term I learned just recently. And by the way, 
Um, if I'm talking too fast, uh, someone let me know because I, I keep forgetting that it's a, about a three second lag and I'm moving these, th these at my speed, but not necessarily your speed. Here's a term we learned from Israel recently, in-home hospitalization. It's not an oxymoron. It's because they've use technology to help treat people in hospitals um, while they're staying and not in hospital. They, it's as if they're in the hospital, they're being treated at home. Uh, so healthcare is especially uh, benefiting from, uh, from technology. Waste management is an industry. Uh, utility settings. I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to move along just a little bit faster. Vehicle, net, vehicle networks and supply chains. Basically any function at work that where you can monitor these tasks. Here's a company that also is helping out with safe workplaces by using Internet of Things in a way that wouldn't be obvious. A company that um, uh, is planning to present with us at a rescheduled event that we actually postponed because uh, we had this one scheduled for last week and out of respect for all of the George Floyd events and um, all of the uh, the healing that's going on in our state right now, we wanted to postpone it. So Harmony Enterprises, small company, southern corner of our state, they have used IoT to make a waste receptacle safer. That door opens automatically so you don't have to touch it. That waste receptacle can inform people via sensors when it's full so you don't have to visit it as often. So if you want to know more about uh, Harmony Enterprises and their Smart Pack product, I'm happy to connect you to the company. So let me know. Robotics is playing a role too. Check this out. There's a restaurant in Budapest, Hungary that's serving people with a robot. And the robot's made by a Japanese developer. Uh, so I haven't seen this in Minnesota yet. Is it coming? I don't know. It's, it's a fascinating development. We all expect to see more robotics, but here's the kicker. They, they're actually employing more people doing the IT than they were. I mean, they're, they're, they have more um, employees now than they did before because of the IT going on in the background. Well, these are good jobs. So for those who are concerned, gosh, it's, you know, that poor restaurant worker might have their job displaced. Well, this is, this is a transition that um, is a separate discussion. We're not going to go too far down that path. But my point is, these are jobs of the future. I think they're here to stay. These are trends that are, that are on the way and robotics plays a chance too. So we're going we're gonna to tell you today what the Internet of Things actually is. We're going to tell you about some of these examples. Um, we want you to know about some of our local resources, and we also want to let you know what those resources are for going internationally and, uh, and, and do a little bit of Q&A. So next, um, we're going to have uh, our first panelist uh, tell you a little bit about what the Internet of Things is all about and a little bit about what their company can do. So I'm going to introduce uh, Kim Pearson now. Kim Pearson is founder and CEO of New Boundary Technologies. Uh, the company helps, the, um, Kim has helped me and Minnesota promote um, the state's role as a global leader in, in IoT. Uh, the company celebrating its 35th anniversary. Uh, they were an IoT company even before we called it IoT. Uh, the company uh, manufactures or uh, uh, sells software for IoT solutions in water management, agriculture, oil and gas, industrial automation, and environmental monitoring, and they distribute them worldwide. Uh, Kim and his company have traveled with the trade office to help grow their business overseas. So I'm really grateful to Kim for inspiring this particular idea that we need to take a look at remote work. And uh, Kim is going to walk us through what IoT means and um, and tell us a little bit about uh, his company as, as well. So Kim, I'll turn it over to you and I'll, I'll advance the slides as needed. So Kim, please. Thank you, Steve. And thank you everyone for joining today. Wouldn't it be amazing if inanimate objects could talk to us and tell us what they're feeling? And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could talk to things and tell them what to do? This isn't science fiction. This is the internet of things. More than 20 billion things are talking to us today. Through the wonders of the internet, we can hear them from miles away. Every second, more than 100 things are being connected to the internet. Every second, 100 things newly being added to the internet. First slide, please. In our personal lives, our homes are connected to the internet. 
We can tell our lights to turn on. We can control our thermostats remotely from our phones. Sensors in our cabin can tell us if our pipes are gonna freeze. In healthcare and telemedicine, IoT connected sensors can send information about the health of our bodies to our healthcare providers. So instead of needing to go to see the doctors, our doctors, pharmacists, and nurses can visit us remotely by video conference. We're all familiar with IoT in our personal lives. This morning, we're going to talk about IoT for business applications, which is often called the industrial Internet of Things. Next, please. In many applications, connecting our things to the internet eliminates over 90% of the visits to go check on their status. With IoT, we can see the status of sensors and equipment anytime from anywhere. So this lets our businesses be safer and more efficient and reduce how many times people need to go on site. This has added benefit to help with COVID-19. So instead of sending people to check things, we let the things talk to us and tell us how they're doing. Next slide. Without IoT, it may take hours before someone even knows that there's an issue that needs to be dealt with for an asset. With IoT, alerts can be sent immediately when an asset needs attention. If someone, in many cases, the issue can be fixed without even needing to send somebody on site. If someone does need to go visit, the right person with the right things can be dispatched quickly the first time. Next, please. At New Boundary Technologies, we've been providing software to monitor and control sensors and equipment since 1985. 20 years ago, we launched an industrial IoT application service that we call Remote Aware, which is just as it says, you can be aware of how your assets are performing remotely from anywhere in the world. So sensor and equipment manufacturers and solution providers private label the Remote Aware software with their own branding and dashboards. Then their customers can monitor and control their sensors and equipment from anywhere in the world securely using just a smartphone, tablet, or PC. Next. So here's a couple of examples of using IoT technology to improve our food supply chain. In poultry and swine production, we use IoT connected sensors to monitor the amount of feed that's in the feed bins, the operation of the feed lines from the bins to the animals, the indoor temperature, humidity, CO2 levels, the electrical power, water pressure, fans op fan operation. So this helps the producer keep the animals healthy and comfortable, and they can optimize the pounds of protein that are produced for each pound of feed that's consumed. In 2015, the avian flu spread to chicken and turkey barns across the country. Minnesota is the number one turkey producer in the U.S., producing about 42 million birds a year. In 2015, over 9 million birds in Minnesota were lost. Fortunately, the Producers working with the state of Minnesota and experts at the University of Minnesota determined that the uh, virus was originating from wild birds, but the farm to farm spread was happening from workers who would pick up the virus in one building and then transport it to another and cause it to spread and then infect that building. So they quickly, industry implemented strict biosecurity procedures and brought the flu under control. So now workers need to park their vehicles away from the building. They need to put on protective clothing before they go into the animal area with covers over their boots. And there's very strict control to make sure that if there is a virus in one building, it won't then get transported to another. So now in IoT, in addition to all of the other sensors, we also can add door open close sensors so that you can tell when someone's going in and video cams to see 
who's inside, and the producers can make sure that the biosecurity procedures are being followed. Next. After recovering from the flu outbreak that affected the animals, the poultry, there was a similar uh, flu that went through with hogs about the same time. The poultry and hog producers today are being impacted by the COVID virus in humans. When the food processing plants are shut down due to COVID, they can't take their animals to market. So IoT technology is also being used in the food processing to optimize production. We do a lot with IoT technology to monitor tank level uh, of all of the ingredients in the plants. So uh, in food and beverage, there's large containers of sugar, flour, corn syrup, soy oil, dextrose, and usually only one tank of each ingredient. So if it runs out, the whole line is shut down. But if the truck gets there too early and it delivers by the truckload, the truck is then sitting in the parking lot waiting for the inventory level to go down far enough so that they can make their delivery. And if the truck's sitting in the parking lot, then it can't go and get its load to go to the next plant that it needs to go to. So with uh, tank level sensors that can be securely viewed over the internet, now the suppliers and the trucking companies that haul for them can see up to the minute what the ingredient levels are in the tank that they're responsible for so they can optimize their deliveries to do just-in-time inventory. Next slide. Oh. Now just add, actually, this is becoming more important with COVID because now as the plants are needing to adjust shifts and schedule production schedules based on these physical distancing and uh, to keep workers apart, the ingredient usage schedules are becoming very dynamic and much less predictable than they were uh, before. So having that up to the minute view is critical to be able to keep the plants operating uh, efficiently. So with all of these uh, applications, IoT is uh, applying, as Steve mentioned, across virtually every vertical. And the reasons people are adopting IoT is to get in the industrial business space is to become more efficient, lower their costs. Other benefits as a result is by not needing to send people to the assets to check them. That reduces energy and water usage for fuel production, reduces CO2 emissions, it reduces air pollution. So uh, IoT is uh, just as the Internet of People has transformed our personal lives, the Internet of Things is transforming business. This is being driven by the uh, rapid changes in wireless technology that is dropping the cost to connect devices and make them smart by double digits every year. So just as the CPU revolution, um, cost revolution drove the adoption of PCs, the cost of the communications technology is driving the cost of um, IoT adoption. Uh, um, next slide, please. So in addition to the benefits for um, getting more efficient, in many applications now, IoT can help to reduce the spread of COVID. So there's really, uh, as we are uh, getting back to work with uh, dealing with COVID for the foreseeable future, really two objectives. We want to increase the physical distance between people and then eliminate the number of surface touches that could be a transfer point for the virus. So doing that, if we can reduce the number of people that need to enter a facility, and if within a facility, they can do their work from anywhere so that there can be spaced out how many people are in an area at a time and have predictable traffic um, patterns, that 
helps to reduce what the spread, the risk is of spreading COVID. And then an additional benefit is for many jobs that would typically be in person where someone needs to go check something, if they test positive for COVID and need to self-isolate at home for a couple of weeks, um, with IoT technology, many of those positions can be where some of or all of their job could be done remotely. And so that the business doesn't need to backfill what the position is and the employee doesn't need to take two weeks of sick time if they're asymptomatic. Next slide. So whenever there's change that creates opportunities, technology is accelerating the pace of change and uh, the COVID, as we're all well aware of, is resulting in very, very dramatic changes in a very short period of time. So this, for those who can identify and capitalize on them, creates a lot of new opportunities. So there's opportunities in your business to use technology to be more COVID resistant and to uh, move some additional jobs to where they can be done from anywhere um, in addition to the kind of traditional digital office jobs that have moved to homes today. And then there's opportunities for technology solution providers to offer new solutions to be able to help businesses become more virus resistant. Um, our next, I'll pass back to Steve to introduce uh, Bob, our next presenter, who's got an incredible sol IoT solution for um, making businesses more um, safer places. And what's interesting is this is um, not specific to COVID, that all of the benefits uh, were there for smart buildings prior to COVID. And then this is now a new benefit that uh, is available as a result of the COVID outbreak. Uh, Steve. Thank you, Kim, and, and well done. Fantastic overview of what IoT is and the incredible number of ways across every vertical that IoT can play a role. Uh, uh, most impressive. So uh, we're really grateful that uh, uh, that Mintech uh, sent us to Bob French. Uh, this was a, a revelation to me that uh, that the world of HVAC can be can have such a sophisticated role in making sure that our air quality um, is um, is under control at a time when we're all nervous about the spaces that we're entering. So uh, Bob French is going to tell us about that. Bob French is chief evangelist for 75F, a local applied IoT tech firm building the world's best building intelligence platform. Bob's working with building owners across the country to help them reopen their buildings in the COVID era. Bob will present guidance for reopening buildings and how technology can make that easier and safer. Bob, tell us about 75F. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to do this. A lot of us are concerned right now. Uh, buildings are opening across the state. And uh, so in times like this, we look to um, guidance from the authorities. Next slide. So the guidance that we're following is coming from the CDC and ASHRAE. ASHRAE has formed an epidemic task force, and this is the a society of engineers who essentially determine how buildings are operating especially regarding their um, heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning, HVAC systems. Next slide. So what we're going to talk about today is what is ASHRAE and CDC recommending, uh, how ventilation systems work, because I just want to make sure everybody understands the basics of how this happens in a building so you can understand what we're uh, suggesting. The science behind those guidelines, you know, where does that come from? how to follow the guidelines. I'm going to be giving you some practical information today and then some implications for utility costs. Next slide. So first of all, what is the CDC recommending? So as we uh, reopen our buildings, there's a couple of different things um, that they're recommending. They have guidance for how to reopen a building that's been closed for a long time. And they also have guidance for how to keep your building running and safely, uh, considering that there is an infectious aerosol. Um, the most uh, current one, of course, is COVID-19. Everybody knows this. 
Uh, they're saying things like keep systems running longer, uh, perhaps 24 by 7, um, if possible, to exchange uh, air constantly, uh, to increase the amount of outdoor air ventilation. Um, of course, in some places that doesn't apply here in Minnesota in highly polluted areas, there's some caution needed there. Um, disable demand control ventilation, which is a CO2 based um, outside air sequence. Uh, open outside air dampers as high as 100% to reduce or eliminate recirculation. And in just a minute, I'm going to explain what that is. And improve central air filtration to MERV 13 or higher, if possible, um, uh, the, the highest that your filter rack can, can take. Next slide, please. Now, likewise, ASHRAE is making recommendations of their own. Um, they do follow, I could go next slide, please. They do follow very similar guidelines um, as uh, CDC. Um, they are recommending that we flush the, uh, the building for two hours before and after occupancy, um, open up the outside air uh, dampers to the maximum amount possible while, accept, um, while maintaining acceptable indoor air conditions and also disable demand control ventilation. Next slide. So before we get into the details, we're gonna to explain just a little bit how ventilation systems work in commercial buildings. Next slide. So here's a illustration of what a rooftop unit looks like. As you drive down the highway, you see those metal boxes on the roofs of uh, buildings. It's a very common type of uh, heating and air conditioning system that you'll find in commercial buildings. Um, so air comes in from the outside. You'll see the red arrow on the left. Um, that comes in through what's called the outside air damper, and it's mixed with uh, some return air from the inside of the building. That's the yellow arrow that's coming up and uh, mixing with it. And it gets conditioned by our AC system at this type of the year, and that's the blue arrow that then goes down into the building. So where the return air and the outside air mix is called a mixing chamber. And there's automation that we control, for example, that most building automation systems control, which will change that ratio between the return air and the outside air. When I was talking about earlier um, recirculation, right, this is where you control how much recirculation is occurring. So the recommendation is to eliminate recirculation and bring in only outside air. Now there's some limitations to this, right? The equipment um, in hot weather isn't designed or it's not sized properly to do that completely. And so it can be a challenge, but that is the recommendation. And so why is that? Next slide, please. So the CDC um, has uh, come out with um, some studies and recommendations. Next slide. Um, so the, first of all, there's a, a case study um, that you'll, you'll find on the CDC website. Next slide which uh, uh, examines a call center in uh, South Korea. And it showed how one person was able to infect you know, 94 other people on a single floor of this building. And so um, you know, the, the recommendation is, and the science is supporting that um, ventilation and um, uh, infection through the air you know, is a path you know, for uh, the coronavirus. So even though, um, there was considerable interaction in other floors. It was really this one floor, the 11th floor, where most of the infection occurred. And so this indicates to us that the duration of interaction, right, was an important factor in the further spreading of COVID-19. Next slide. So since the duration is important, um, it, is a it is necessary to understand another concept which we call the viral load. The viral load is nothing more than the concentration of the virus per cubic um, foot of air, right? So the idea is to dilute the amount of concentration in the air through a process called dilution ventilation. And that's essentially what's behind the uh, science to uh, open up the amount of outside air. So by re bringing in more fresh outside air, we reduce the concentration of the virons that are in the air inside the building. Next slide. Okay, 
Um, so, uh, you know, there are other scientific uh, studies that have been done to the American Society for Microbiology um, have also come out with, you know, similar recommendations that um, power, um, higher outside air fractions um, and increased exchange rates, you know, dilute those viral loads, you know, indoors. So um, it also uh, talks about humidity and a relative humidity as being a factor in uh, something that we want to look at. So not only do we want to bring in more outside air, we want to control humidity. Next slide. Now, why is that? Um, it turns out that uh, humidity has a very strong effect on the size of the particles. So the size of the particles are important because the smaller the particles are, the longer they will tend to float you know, in the air. The big particles will tend to form um, and then drop to surfaces where they can be disinfected, right? Um, so it turns out that uh, higher humidity levels encourage larger size particles, which is what we want. We want the particles to travel only a short distance before their weight just carries them down to a surface where they can be um, inactivated by, by cleansing. Next slide. Well, it turns out that not only do these uh, size particles drop faster um, with uh, uh, higher humidity, it turns out that the life of the virus themselves, the virus itself, um, is affected by the indoor relative humidity and that at 50%, the inactivation rate of the virus is the fastest. So uh, we really want to keep our humidity levels between 40 and 60%. Now, uh, why do we want to keep it under 60%? Uh, that's because other factors come into play once we get above 60%, meaning that we then start encouraging the growth of other pathogens like mold, right? So if it's, uh, if it's too dry, the virons get small and they live longer. And if it's too wet, then we get other problems. So this 40 to 60% window is what we're looking for. So next slide. So um, let's talk about some practical things that you can do to follow the CDC and ASHRAE guidelines. Next slide. So there are different kinds of systems uh, that you'll find. Um, so first of all, during occupied hours, we wanna uh, open up our outside air dampers as much as we can, as high as 100% if possible. We wanna purge the building with fresh outside air for two hours before and, uh, before and after occupied hours. And we wanna disable demand control ventilation um, that's using CO2 sensors to figure out how much occupancy there is in the building. And if you have a VAV system, we wanna increase the discharge air temperature from the unit so that the VAV terminals will be as wide as possible. Next slide. So specifically, how do you do this with the type of systems that you have? So if in your building you have thermostats, you're gonna wanna get up on the roof and open up your outside air damper. And over on the right is a picture of what an outside air damper looks like. So if you can um, open up your outside air damper, you also wanna turn on your fan to, the, um, to be on at all times, uh, not in auto. It's very common if you have a thermostat that you're using really a residential thermostat, which has an auto mode, right? Commercial buildings, we don't want that auto mode operating during um, COVID. And if you have an economizer, um, which is like that damper that you see over on the right, but much larger, you're gonna wanna call your HVAC tech to set the minimum position as much as they can. They might have to do some testing. Um, they might not be able to get it to 100% open. It depends on the size of your unit. Um, you want them to uh, set it as wide as possible. Now, if you have a typical building automation system, um, you'll have your HVAC um, automation tech um, edit the settings um, for the outside air damper uh, to as much as 100% as possible and uh, disabling demand control ventilation. Now, if you are a 75F customer, no need to worry about any of those things. We'll take care of it for you. Just let us know you wanna do it. Um, and we'll turn on what we call the epidemic mode in which all of these guidelines will automatically be uh, followed on your behalf. Next step. So um, the, the sequence of operation for the pre and post purge. how do you do that? So if you have a thermostat, 
Um, how do you do that? Really, your only choice is to change your occupied hours to two hours before you're occupied and two hours after. Now, it's unfortunate that you're going to be conditioning your building when you do that, which is a waste of energy. You really only need the fresh air that the fan brings in. But um, if you just have a thermostat, that's all you can do. If you have a typical legacy type um, building automation system, just edit the fan um, to cover that setting um, two hours pre and post occupancy. And once again, if you are a 75F customer, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it for you um, with our epidemic mode. All right, so what I'd like to do now is if there are any questions that are specific, because this is a highly technical topic, I'd like to go ahead and answer those questions now while they're fresh in your mind. So, Bob, we do have a question that came in from Linda. Linda is wondering, will increased ventilation increase my utility bills? Uh, yes. Um, increased ventilation, especially the outside air fraction, which is being recommended by the CDC and ASHRAE, um, will increase your utility bills. Uh, the reason is because outside air is the most expensive kind of air to condition. The reason why we have recirculation um, that I uh, described earlier is to keep the costs down. Uh, the air that's inside your building is generally going to be closer to what you want than the areas outside, especially on a warm, humid day. So when you increase your ventilation rates, your outside air fraction, it will put a heavier load on your equipment and you'll be running those compressors longer. Um, we are doing some studies right now to find out exactly how much that is and it will be limited by the size of your equipment. Um, since a lot of equipment isn't very much bigger than what was designed, um, I have a, a, an educated guess that your utility bills will go up something along the lines of maybe 20% or, or less. Um, also, here's another question that just came in from Dante. Dante is wondering, who do you partner with to install your solution? We partner with mechanical contracting companies and uh, systems integrators, control companies. So the HVAC contractor that you work with in your building is likely someone that we would work with. Um, and certainly for uh, local companies in the Twin Cities, um, we can um, meet with you directly and either work to find a partner, a mechanical partner, or work with the one that you are already uh, working with. Thanks, Bob. That's all the questions we have right now, but if you have any questions later on, feel free to type them into the questions window and we will answer more at the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Piper. Uh, Bob, what really stood out for me listening to you this morning is how, how vital it is that a company like yours needs to understand the underlying science of virus behavior and all the environmental variables in play, the humidity, air volumes, air movement. Um, it's impressive. Uh, so uh, congratulations to your company for, uh, for, for applying that much uh, science to what you do. Uh, and it makes me feel more confident that if, if a building's controlled by 75F technology, it's as safe as it can be. So, so thank you for your presentation this morning. Uh, so uh, this slide here shows Bob's contact info. We have a slide at the very end of our presentation today that's got everyone's contact info. And if you don't want to write it down, um, in the right-hand margin of your, uh, of your dashboard, you will see a couple of docs that you can download, uh, including today's slides in PDF format uh, that has that slide with all of our contact info as well. So we want to make sure that it is easy for you to reach out to us if you would like to. So now um, we're going to transition to resources. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kim Pearson to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the local resources and organizations that um, he is familiar with. So back to you, Kim. Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, so uh, IoT for the industrial Internet of Things is uh, generally a little more complicated than the consumer applications where you don't just go into Best Buy and pick it up and bring it home and uh, install it. Depending on what the application is, there's a lot of different technologies to choose from to implement an IoT solution. And there's a lot of moving parts. So there's the sensors or equipment, there needs to be hardware 
to get that information from the equipment to the uh, internet and then host the data up in the cloud, data plans to get it from the equipment up to the internet, the application software, data analytics. Um, so bringing all of those pieces together can be a little daunting when starting out. Um, fortunately, uh, Minnesota is a global leader in IoT technology providers. So we have leading, uh, world leading companies in every part of what's called the IoT stack to build solutions uh, on it. And um, uh, we'd be glad to be a resource for anyone if you've got questions for both Minnesota companies and then um, because we've been in IoT since its uh, infancy, have hundreds of contacts around the world that we'd be glad to make referrals uh, for anyone who uh, would um, have any questions they'd like. So this slide shows a few organizations uh, and companies within uh, Minnesota just wanted to highlight uh, the three on the top that are uh, nonprofits that are great benefits for IoT. So first for MinTech, and thank you very much for uh, hosting today. Um, uh, MinTech um, provides a platform to explore IoT issues and solutions with events just like this one today. In addition, they recognize and honor IoT innovations with uh, Techni Awards. For those who aren't familiar with it, um, it um, is very competitive to then recognize the leading Minnesota technology uh, providers each year uh, in a number of different categories. Uh, my daughter's uh, in Hollywood and did the Emmy submissions for the Netflix shows a few years ago. So I kind of equate it to being the Oscars or the Emmys for technology companies. Um, and then in addition, they're keeping tabs on what's happening at the legislature to make sure that the laws are in place to benefit IoT uh, proliferating. The uh, second organization that is a great resource here in Minnesota is called IoT Fuse. And they're a nonprofit that brings together the IoT technology providers, the IoT maker community, businesses that want to implement and produce IoT solutions and students. And they have a series of monthly meetups and annual IoT Fuse conference that's one of the leading ones in the world. And then in addition to the general IoT conference, they're now doing IoT vertical specific conferences. So there's a MedFuse conference for medical technologies, an AgFuse conference for IoT and agriculture. And this year they're going to be launching Retail Fuse. Um, so highly recommend um, getting connected into IoT Fuse and um, a great uh, organization for both education, but also then to make connections to resources that would be useful to you. And then the last one I'll uh, highlight is mini analytics. So as we talked about um, this morning on IoT, there's uh, an immediate benefit in industrial IoT for being able to see how your assets are performing anytime from anywhere without having to send people around to check on things that are working. So in water utilities, you can eliminate 95% of the visits to just check lift stations because um, you can see if there's how they're doing and if there's a problem, they'll tell you. Uh, and then that getting alerted right away when there's an issue to go dispatch things. That's kind of the uh, uh, immediate first phase benefit from uh, IoT when we connect our sensors and equipment to the internet. Once it's been out there for a year or so where we've got a lot of data and history for how the assets are performing, that usually we have no idea when they're out in the field, when they're unconnected, then we can take that data and do analyzing of it to get preventative, proactive, predictive in managing our assets. Um, Harmony that uh, Steve mentioned is a great example with that with the trash compactors that in addition to making it more efficient to pick up the trash where you don't need to go visit them until they're ready to be picked up just in time, emptied just in time, and now 
preventing COVID with the no touch, they're actually by having the data from it, able to advise their customers on when it's time to do maintenance on the compactors because they know how much they're being used by getting the data on the internet. So there's a great organization in Minnesota called Mini Analytics that is a nonprofit that brings together the data science community and the whole data analytics field is changing very, very rapidly, just as the IoT uh, technology is. And so once you get the data, then going to that level two of benefit um, is where Mini Analytics is a great resource. Um, so like I said, be glad to be a resource for anyone or contact information is the, the end to make introductions to companies and organizations that can be useful to you. Steve. Kim, excellent summary of each of those organizations. Boy, we are really blessed in this state with, with a lot of support. Quick note on IoT Fuse, um, the conference of the same name, IoT Fuse. They had to very quickly pivot this year from a live event, which typically is drawn over a thousand. And I think one year they had 1,500. They had to pivot with very little notice to doing an all virtual event. Kim and I gave a variation on this presentation at this year's virtual variation or virtual version of, of the IoT Fuse event, but still highly recommended. We sure hope they'll be back live next year. So a couple more resources to wrap up. Um, I want to emphasize one more time uh, that. This problem isn't only local. The rest of the world is trying to figure out telework, is trying to figure out how to keep people working. This is um, just a one narrow example um, in Japan. Japan was struggling to uh, figure out telework because they had some office culture issues that were slowing them down. They love official seals over there. Um, and it was making it difficult to keep people out of the office. Anybody who can help Japan with that issue um, will help their economy. Yeah, so I present it merely as one example among I'm sure countless others that there's a market overseas for help with um, with workplaces around the globe. Uh, so resources and follow through. Uh, Kim just told you about IoT Fuse, Mintech, and some of the other organizations, and he knows them better than I, uh, even though I interact with a couple of them from time to time too. But think of him as a as a resource for for being connected to those organizations on that previous slide. If you're if you're thinking internationally, um, I will be your primary point of contact. Um, we got a fantastic ecosystem here. A couple of those logos really illustrated that. Um, I'm going to show you just a snapshot of our industry profile here in a sec. It's one of the documents that, that is in the um, um, in the margins of the of the dashboard. You can download it, uh, 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 that doc as well. If you're a startup and you haven't yet heard of Launch Minnesota, let me know. I'd be happy to connect you to them uh, because uh, Minnesota, uh, for a little for about a year now, has had a uh, an organization devoted just to helping out our state startups, and a lot of them are in the IoT field. So here's a just a screenshot of what that brochure actually looks like. Um, if you'd like to have a look, uh, please download it. Um, our state really is a leader in this field. Um, Kim's one of the people who helped uh, show us that. Uh, eight rich pages of detail on um, on our companies here, our expertise here, and we're in the business now telling the rest of the world, hey, we have a great IoT ecosystem here. Please use it. Uh, okay, new normal. Uh, the business, our trade off, the trade office is still open for business. Tap our office for for our expertise and our services. Help you grow overseas. Consider use of a STEP grant. STEP is an acronym for a state trade uh, and export program grant. Um, there's funds from both the state of Minnesota and the federal government. You can get up to $5,000 to help you with export promotion activities. Uh, and you can use them even when you're not traveling overseas. If you're trying to, let's say, uh, find a new distributor for your, for your product or your service in another market, and you need to pay for services to actually line up distributor candidates, you could pay for that with using a step grant. That's it, that's eligible. So contact me about that one. Uh, Kim has been a customer of, uh, of the step grant program. Uh, Kim and I traveled to a trade show and conference in Israel this past November. Um, and so he was one of several companies that tapped it. So you should consider it too. Uh, travel with us in the future. We hope to have an actual trade mission one of these days, probably after there's a vaccine and people are comfortable traveling again. We may even be putting together some virtual travel events. Uh, where I'm, Later today, I actually am going to be listening to a presentation on how you put together a trade mission that's virtual. So yet another transition that we're all making. 
the Minnesota Trade Office has got a calendar of events that you can monitor, get on our mailing list if you're not already on it. Happy to tell you about our export promotion events. I will close because we're down to five minutes. I really would like to finish on time for those who've got um, a 12 o'clock commitment. I'm just gonna read this quote to you. In an instant, uh, COVID-19 has forced a move to, um, oh, I can't even see the rest of my slide. I have to move it aside here, I can't read that word. Um, a move to a new model and a social barrier has been broken. After this crisis, some percentage of managers will have made the transition to a new skill set. This came from a Forbes magazine article entitled COVID-19, the digital economy change agent. So maybe the virus is doing us a favor. Maybe it's accelerating, ex uh, accelerating a move to a new model. And maybe you are one of those managers who will learn this new skill set. So think about that. That's my message. Now, before we go to Q&A, um, I'm putting up the, uh, the contact information here. This, uh, so you can contact me or Kim or Bob or Piper. Uh, and if you don't wanna write it down again, and you can just download the, the brochure, or sorry, the, the PDF version of the slides, which is over in your dashboard. Before we go to any Q&A, um, which we won't have a ton of time for, but I wanna give each of my uh, co-panelists today a chance to offer any final thought on their messaging. Kim, I'll start with you. Any final thoughts or observations from today? Yeah, I guess I would leave with, um, we all know how video conferencing is changing our world to be able to connect people to people and our being right here being an example. During the time we've been together, over 300,000 new things have been connected to the internet. So just look in your businesses and around you, what are the things that if they could talk to you, you could likewise get that benefit that we're doing for people to people in having people to things communication. Kim, fantastic message, message to all of you. Look around your office, look around your workplace. Could it be connected? Great question. Bob, your thoughts. Yeah, my thought is that uh, we're going to be opening up our offices. We need our offices to uh, carry out commerce. And uh, living with COVID is not a short-term thing. It's going to be a year, two years. Um, and it is something that uh, people need to actually uh, change the way their buildings operate. Um, we're doing a whole webcast series on this topic um, called Healthier Buildings. So um, you can learn more uh, along the lines of what I was talking about today about living with COVID. Excellent message, Bob. We're all coming to terms with the this thing is not gonna be over by the summer. So everything you heard today, apply it to the longer term, not just for right now. So with that, we are down to just two minutes. Um, I don't know if Piper is in the habit of letting these um, events go past 12, but maybe we've got time for one or two questions because um, I again, I'd like to wrap up really close to 12. Piper, any questions come in for us? Um, just one more question for Kim. Uh, this comes from David and they're wondering, what is the cost of connecting things to the internet? Yes, so that's a, a key question. And so the first is, it's with many things, it depends because is it indoors, outdoors, how many things, how much data? The general trend is that for each one the, of the applications, the costs are coming down by double digits uh, every year. So I'll just kind of give some representative numbers for uh, an example indoor uh, application where to connect things up to a wireless cellular router that would get the information to the internet used to be where just a few years ago those uh, devices would be in the eight or nine hundred dollar range and you'd need three or four per floor with the new technology for a similar application they're two or three hundred dollars but instead of three or four per floor, you have one for every three to four floors in a building. So, you know, 10 times fewer devices at a third of the cost each on the hardware. And then the communication plans on the cellular that just a few years ago might have been $30 a month to get the connection up has come down where now you can, for many applications, be getting data plans that are down at $2 a month. So when you, uh, so those are kind of some typical ballpark 
numbers on kind of some hardware communications. There's, you know, software hosting kinds of costs. It's a couple dollars a month, but uh, um, uh, depends on your application. But general trend is that uh, dropping very, very fast. So if it seems too expensive today, come back in two years and it'll probably have a good ROI. Thanks, Kim. So if you have any other questions, we're out of time today, uh, but you can always email us. Um, email it to whoever the question is specific for, or you can reach out to me and I can connect you to all of our wonderful presenters here today. Um, you will receive a recording of this and we will also be sharing it on social and on our website so you can go back and revisit it anytime. I just want to wrap up by saying thank you so much to Steve, Kim, and Bob for joining us today. And if you have interest in checking out any of our other uh, events or programming, feel free to just look at mintech.org and on our events tab, we'll have everything listed there. Thank you so much, Piper. It was great working with you. Very grateful. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Get in touch with us. Goodbye. Goodbye.